when we receive the results of those biopsies, there might be some degree of hyperplasia. Our understanding of hyperplasia has undergone a lot of changes over the last few years. Classically speaking, we were taught there was simple hyperplasia and complex hyperplasia, and each of these could have either no atypia of the nuclear structures or have atypia. No atypia or have atypia. And we were taught that women with uh, these different degrees of hyperplasia with and without atypia had future risk of developing an endometrial cancer. And what was quoted in the literature for many years was that uh, simple hyperplasia without atypia had less than a 1% risk of developing a malignancy. Complex hyperplasia with no atypia had about a 3% risk. Simple hyperplasia with atypia had about a 9% risk. And complex hyperplasia with atypia about a 29% risk. What this didn't capture is the reality that many of these women already have developed a malignancy. And if you're interested, I would turn your attention to a publication called GOG-167, which clearly established that if a woman has complex hyperplasia with atypia, that person already has a 43% chance of having cancer currently. Not in the future, but currently. Meaning the hyperplastic and neoplastic process that we see is actually worse than we used to think it is. So it's important that we counsel patients correctly. Type 1 cancers, which are typically the end result of hyperplasia, are almost always endometrioid type and they often are grade 1. As I mentioned earlier, type 2 cancers are entirely different. These typically are high grade and more worrisome cell types such as papillary serous and clear cell. These two are high grade by definition. When we talk about risk factors, to summarize this, for developing type 1 cancers or hyperplasia, the risk factors all have to do with some source of excess estrogen. For type 2 cancers, there are no known risk factors. And like many human cancers, this likely has to do with either a genetic inheritance pattern of a faulty tumor suppressor gene or the inherent genomic instability we all have that over time can lead to dysfunction of critical tumor suppressor genes such as p53. The type 1 cancers, as mentioned, can be in premenopausal women or postmenopausal women. Type 2 cancers are almost universally in older patients or postmenopausal women. You occasionally see a type 2 cancer in a younger woman, but it's fairly rare. Last thing I want to discuss is how to work somebody up and what to do. The easy recommendation has to do with what to do with a postmenopausal woman. Any bleeding needs an investigation. It is a pitfall to have a conversation about how much bleeding she is doing to, in order to make a decision about whether to investigate or not. Any amount of bleeding requires an investigation and should find a source. The source may be on the vulva, the vagina, the cervix, the rectum, the bladder, or inside the uterus. And all these things must, must be taken into consideration. An endometrial biopsy is warranted 
if there's not another explanation. And that endometrial biopsy can typically be done in the office, or an alternative is to go to the operating room and do a hysteroscopy and a DNC. The advantage of the hysteroscopy is you get a very clear picture and a directed biopsy. In this drawing I drew before, side view of the uterus, if a thin woman has postmenopausal bleeding and is not taking exogenous estrogen, it's unlikely that she has a field effect of lots of estrogen around, as I described before. It is these patients that are more at risk for having developed a discrete punctate cancer that eventually leads to bleeding. And you can see in this case, it's possible if you do a blind biopsy that you may not actually get tissue because the, the abnormal process is not filling the whole uterus. In these patients, if you do do an office biopsy and it's non-diagnostic or even negative, you may not trust it and may still need to go to the operating room to actually visualize the endometrium and make sure you're not dealing with something like this. In the premenopausal women, it's much more difficult to figure out who to perform a biopsy and who not to. Many women with PCOS, as described before, have had lifelong oligoovulation and therefore lifelong abnormal bleeding pattern. They may have two, three, four periods a year and they don't know when they're coming and when they do come they may last for a prolonged period of time. Since those women are at risk for eventually developing uh, hyperplasia or a malignancy, tissue acquisition at some point would be important. It is useful to know that the vast majority of endometrial hyperplasias and cancers occur in women with an abnormal ovulation pattern and in their 40s, meaning it seems to take quite a long time of abnormal uh, ovulation to develop a hyperplasia or cancer in premenopausal women. You can see it in the 20s and 30s, but again, that's, pro that's almost always been preceded by near lifelong uh, menstrual abnormalities. The advice is for women that you believe have PCOS would be to perform an endometrial biopsy sometime in their early 40s to figure out where you stand at that time. Alternatively would be women in their 30s who have never had normal menstrual periods and therefore have likely had 20 plus years of oligoovulation. It may be prudent at some point to do a biopsy on those women as well. The hyperplasia can be managed uh, medically as long as you're not dealing with complex atypical hyperplasia. That also can be managed medically, but as I said, since almost half those patients already have a cancer, uh, there's a much uh, longer conversation as to how to best manage that. You can see reversals of endometrial hyperplasia and cancers if they're low grade. One option is medical treatment using progestins, and there are many different options there, but that's the general heading and category. The success rate, if you have a low-grade cancer, is fairly low, but since many of these women are premenopausal and likely uh, may want to preserve their childbearing ability, we do uh, um, offer them that with full, uh, uh, clear counseling. In addition to progestins, many of these women benefit from being on metformin, undergoing dietary changes, nutritional counseling, and if they're obese, consideration of bariatric surgery. In the presence of cancers where childbearing is not an issue, then we proceed with hysterectomy, usually with removal of both tubes and ovaries, lymph node dissection from pelvis and in selected cases along the aorta and beta cava, and other biopsies as directed. The results of those surgical interventions give us knowledge about the stage of the cancer and therefore what further treatment, if any, is necessary. Thank you. I hope this has helped frame your understanding of endometrial hyperplasia and cancers.